This message is about standing in an evil time, folks, because we're in an evil time today, and it's going to get worse. I wish I could tell you it's going to get better, but I can't. I feel in my, in my heart I'm maybe two years down the road from where we are right now, spiritually, seeing something that's coming our way. And we're going to have to learn to stand in an evil time. Even as I speak tonight, laws in the Western world are being passed, making it hate speech and a jailable offense to have a contrary to opinion to the public thought or the, of our present uh, societies. It's, uh, it's a very, very perilous day. Just as Paul said, perilous times are coming in the last days. But you can stand and you will stand. If you will hear this message tonight, God will do something in your life that will give you and I the ability to stand and face the storms that are coming all of our way. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning at verse 10, Paul the Apostle said these words. Now he's the one who warned us in the last days that perilous times are going to come. And I believe that perilous times are here. They're not coming. They're already here. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. He doesn't say be strong in yourself. Be strong in your own confidence. Be strong in your own abilities. No, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. In other words, that which God is willing to do in an obedient life and through an obedient heart. And not through the naturally strongest among us. It's the person you'd be amazed who's going to stand in the coming days. A lot of people who we thought were going to stand are going to cave. They're going to bend. They're going to bow. They're going to compromise. Churches that we thought were strong churches are going to be uh, heading off into the same debauchery as the society around us. You'd be surprised who's going to stand. You'd be surprised who's going to take over pulpits in our generation. The guy with the broom at the back who really did trust in God. Suddenly when there's nobody in the pulpit, perhaps that's the person that God will call. What does it matter as long as it's somebody who has a trust in God and is willing to stand and face the opposition that we're going to all have to face? Put on the whole armor of God. Say it with me, the whole armor of God. Not half of the armor, not part of the armor, not the selective parts that we like. Not just, you see, the devil doesn't need much more than just one part of your character to get a hold of you. That's why Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Not a half of it, not part of it, not selective things. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The schemes. You see, the devil's been around a lot longer than us. And he's had a long time to formulate his plans against you. The schemes, the devices, the, the whispers, the thoughts, the foxes that run through the vines of your mind, the, the demonic whispers, the, the things he will try, the fears he'll try to put into your heart. It's only in the armor of God that we can stand against these things, not in anybody's natural strength. It's, it's not, you look in the book of, of 1 Corinthians, it's, it's not the mighty, it's not the noble, it's, it's the weak, it's the, it's the nobodies, it's the nothings, it's, it's people who despise what they are even, or used to be that God takes and puts his spirit upon us and makes us into something more than we could ever hope to be in our own strength. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We're not fighting against people. Now we realize that people are the instruments sometimes who come under the influence of demonic powers, but they are not the real fight. They're just hapless victims being used in a sense by darkness to bring an agenda of hell into this world that is against Christ and against his truth and against his church. And we can't even see these powers, let alone fight against them, apart from the power of Christ in each of our lives. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. In other words, take up the whole armor of God that, that you, you can stand in the midst of this onslaught of hell that's now coming over the whole world. Seemingly in the last just couple of years, it's getting worse almost every day now. And having done all to stand. So this is the promise from God's word that we're not going to be blown over by adversity. We're building our lives on the truth of God's word. And when the rains come and the winds blow and the seas rage, we will stand. That's the promise of the word of God. We will withstand this onslaught. As a matter of fact, I, I, I have a picture in my mind of not just standing still and, and trusting that we're not going to get knocked over, but actually advancing against this darkness, actually moving into this darkness and making a difference in our generation. We're not called just to stand. 
We're called to withstand. We're, that means we're, we're pushing back against these gates of hell that are trying to prevail and destroy an entire generation. And we're doing it in the strength of our God. And the promise of God, if we put on the whole armor of God, is that when it's all over, we're still standing, thank God. When, when our day is done, when the battle has been finished, when we're called home to be with God, or right up to that final moment, we are still standing in the strength of our God. Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, put on the breastplate of righteousness. In other words, learn truth, as, as Paul said to Timothy, study. Study the Word of God, know the Word of God, but also there's a psalmist who said, Thy word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. The Word of God has to go from your head to your heart. It's got to become part of the fabric of your being. There's got to be something in me that says, God, this is true. I, it doesn't matter what I think, it doesn't matter what other people say. It doesn't matter what the rest of society is doing. It doesn't even matter what the backslidden church is doing. This is true. And this is what I'm going to base my life on. And I'm going to study this. I'm going to put it around my middle parts as it is. I, I'm going to embrace. I'm going to imbibe. I'm going to, I'm going to love your word. It's going to change my character. It's going to change my life. It's going to change my future. It's going to change the source of my strength. Devour this truth. Eat this truth. Taste this truth and then put on that breastplate. Take it from your head and put it near your heart. Oh, I, how I love thy word, the psalmist says. How I love your word, oh God. How I love it when I open your word and it's my guide. It's, it's in a sense your love letter to me. It's, it's your way of making sure I have strength to stand in the evil day. Stand there, it says, having girded your waist with truth and putting on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of, of peace. In other words, your feet shod means that you're, you are, you're dressed to go. You're dressed to fight, you're dressed to bring, you're dressed to make a difference. You're, you're not standing still with shoes on. You know, when you put your shoes on, you're generally going somewhere. Generally speaking, you're going somewhere when you put your shoes on. So when he says, put on the shoes of the preparation of the gospel, in other words, you're, you're preparing for a journey that God has uniquely for your life. Listen to me online tonight. You're, God didn't design you to be sitting depressed on your couch tonight or taking drugs or smoking weed or drinking alcohol, whatever it is you're doing, or hating your neighbor or thinking about that person that did you wrong and all this other stuff. You weren't designed for that. You were designed for a journey that brings glory to His name. You're, you're designed to be a, a, a breath of fresh air in a, in, a, in, a, in a world that's starting to stink. That You're designed to bring the fragrance of Christ with you everywhere you go. Put on these shoes and start moving into what God has for your life. And take the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. In other words, you have to know who you are in Christ and know that there's going to be a fight. When you're putting on a steel helmet, for example, and you're, you're carrying a shield and you got a sword, you know you're in for a fight. No, this, it's such an erroneous thought to think that Christian life is just some kind of never-ending bliss. It will be one day. Oh yeah, we'll be in heaven. There's going to be no, no liars going to be there. No, I promise you no liars are going to be in that place. No, no backstabbers are going to be there. My goodness sakes. There's not going to be any tears. There's no sighing in heaven. Can you imagine? You can't sigh. I sigh a lot throughout my day. And I often think of that. I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to get it all in now. I'm not going to be able to sigh when I get to heaven. And that day is coming. But till that day, this is a fight. This is a fight. The devil's not just about to give up the students at Yale or Cornell or, or uh, some of these other universities that are asking for, for prayer meetings. It, there's going to be a fight. There's going to be a mental fight. That's why I need that helmet of salvation on my head. I need to know who I am in Christ and what I'm called to do. There's going to be, there's going to be darts flying our way. Darts coming from darkness and darts coming from people who are gripped with darkness or influenced by darkness. Things will be said. You have to have the Word of God in your hand. You've got to fight with the weaponry that God's given us. We're not called to be an argument. We're to be called to be a demonstration of the power of God. Our words are to, are to sit on people like a lead weight. If God's in them, if the power of the Holy Spirit is behind them, there's a weight that comes behind our speech. And lastly, he says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, which is staying in communication with God, staying dependent on God. 
Don't lean on your own understanding, the scripture says. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Just talk to him constantly. Be in prayer. Be dependent on, never, never get to the place where you and I are independent of God in what we do. And it's interesting, and it says, and watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. I never saw that till today. You know that part of the spiritual armor is watching out for you and you watching out for me. Isn't that something? That's part of the whole armor. It's not living for me. It's not living a selfish life. It's not just being focused on me, myself, and my ministry and all the rest of that stuff. It's being concerned about you and what's happening in your life and watching for you, the scripture says. You see, because one person can be defeated, but the book of Proverbs tells us that a threefold cord is not easily broken. I want to look at a textbook example of what I'm talking about way back in the book of Daniel. A season where three young men were given the power to stand in an evil time. I want to look in Daniel chapter 1 where it all began. These, these young men are born in a, in a hostile environment really to the things of God. The source of their strength came from knowing and embracing. Remember he said put on this truth around your, your waist and the breastplate of righteousness over your heart. So they knew truth. But they embraced truth even when it was in a convenient time. There's no such a thing in the Christian world as your truth and my truth. You understand? There's only truth. We're living in a world now that the whole concept is your, well, that's your truth, but my truth is there's no such a thing. That's an absurdity. This is truth. There's only truth. And there's only one truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Now, God gifted them because of this, this choice they made. Then, this leader of this particular part of the world got it in his heart, as leaders do, that he was going to recreate the image of what should be worshipped. And of course, it was going to look a lot like him. It was going to look like his value system. It, was, it probably had the image of his face on it. I don't know, but he erected this and built this huge statue. And everybody was involved. The administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all of the officials of the provinces gathered together. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people at the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And he told everybody, the herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O peoples. It sounds so much like our time, doesn't it? O nations and languages, whenever you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, the psaltery, and sympathy with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. It is now going to be a jailable offense to have an alternate opinion to the king's opinion about what should be worshipped, what, what marriage should look like, what, what certain things are and are not in society, no matter what God's word has said. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. But you see, these three boys, they'd already made a decision long ago to do it God's way. This is what God's word says. It doesn't matter what I say or how I think things should be done. This is what God's word says. And so accusers came, which will, you will all have to face accusers. Everyone in this room, everyone online, as you stand up to walk with God, the accusers are coming your way. I, I prophesy to you within the next couple of years, that we're going to so radically change. I hope you keep this message so you can listen to it, so you can find the strength that you're going to need. But certain of the people came forward and accused these three boys, the young men. They said, they do not serve the gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. And the, the king was furious and called them in to, to hold account. And he said, I, I told you that you either bow down to this new order. You either bow down to this new image of man that I'm bringing into this society. If you refuse to bow down, there's going to be a punishment for you. It's going to get very, very hot for you. And then he makes this statement in Daniel 3.15, and who is the God that will deliver you from my hands? You tell me who's going to deliver you. I have more power than you do. I've got, I've got an army behind me. I've got a whole society. I've got governors, administrators, judges. I've got everybody on my side. Everybody is singing the same song. Everybody's bowing to the same image that I've set up. And who do you think you are that you can withstand all of this power coming against you? And who is your God that you think he's going to deliver you with all this power behind what I'm doing? 
and you choose, as he saw it, in your mediocrity to refuse to bow down, who exactly do you think you are? And you will have to face that accusation in this generation. Just exactly what do you think you are? And they answered and they said, if that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the golden image which you have set up. The king was furious and he commanded the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than it normally was. It was actually so hot that it killed the people who threw them into the furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 3.24, was astonished. He rose in haste and spoke and said to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said, Yes, true king. He said, Look, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire. Remember, put on your shoes. They're not standing still, they're walking. They're moving around. You know what they're doing? They're praying. I believe that. They're walking. There are four of them and they're in the midst of the fire. I don't know about you, but I'd be praying if I was there and the fire's all around me and I'm not burnt yet. I'd be praying. God, thank you. Thank you for preserving us. Thank you for keeping us. I think they're looking out for each other. I think it's part of the whole armor of God. How are you doing, Shadrach? How are you doing, Meshach? Hold on. Let's not give up our confidence in God. And they're walking in the midst of the fire and they're praying. I don't know if they saw the fourth man. Do you understand? There's no evidence in Scripture they did. But I know Nebuchadnezzar saw the fourth man in the fire. I don't know if they saw the manifestation of Christ in their midst. But I tell you that when you and I make a choice to stand in the midst of the days that we're about to face, when we are given a supernatural ability to stand, other people see Christ with us. Other people see the Son of God. Hallelujah. We are called to be a demonstration. We're called to bring the presence of God into our present society because He is more powerful than all the governors and judges and magistrates and musicians and kings and everything else that was bowing down and backslidden followers of Jehovah God of that time. He's more powerful than all of that and all He needs is three young men. Come on now. Three young men. When the king saw it, <laughs> he said, there's no God that can deliver like this God. He promoted them and he made a decree, <laughs> which they always would do, because they, he saw that their God was God. And they changed the laws. You know, we're living in a perilous time, but for a season, laws can still be changed. The law of sin and death can be pushed back into the midst of the sea. Spiritual awakening can come but it's going to take people who are willing to stand in an evil time. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus.